Welcome, everybody. Um, and welcome to the new folks I see here tonight. There's, when we see a number of people with, uh, with white hair, we begin to realize that, uh, that uh, Dick Longworth is drawing a crowd beyond our class. So thanks, uh, thanks to everybody for coming. Um, at the end of this, we will, uh, uh, Dick will be available to sign books if you like. Um, community, otherwise, we'll, so when we end this up in about an hour or a little bit more, We'll do a little bit of uh, schmoozing down in front, and you can get a chance to, if you'd like, get your copy of the book signed. So let me do an official introduction. Uh, this is co-sponsored by the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities, along with, uh, along with the Globalization course. So some of those people are here as well. Richard Longworth is a senior fellow at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, a distinguished visiting scholar at DePaul University, and author of the book, Caught in the Middle, America's Heartland in the Age of Globalism. For those of you who are new to, uh, to this class, uh, our class is reading that book and uh, will shortly be in a, uh, in a process of uh, writing a report on it. And I just promised Dick that if we got any good ones, we'd send them along to him so he could, he could use them for his own purposes. Uh, Dick joined the council, that is the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, in 2003 as executive director of, of the Global Chicago Center after a career in journalism, most re recently as a senior correspondent for the Chicago Tribune. For 20 years, he was a foreign correspondent for the Tribune and UPI and was the Tribune's chief European correspondent. He has reported from 75 countries on five continents. He's an Iowa native. He graduated from Northwestern University and won Northwestern, Northwestern's Alumni Merit Award in 2000. He was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard, won the Overseas Press Corps Club Award twice, and was twice a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He has won every major national award for economic reporting, plus the Lowell Thomas Award for a story on a camel trek through the Sahara Desert. Can we hear about that sometime? I, I read that last year when you were here, and I'm wondering about the camel trek through That's the desert. That's another story. <laughs> He's a member of the Council on Foreign Relations in New York, has been a speaker at the Davos conferences and for five years was a mentor to Streetwise, Chicago's newspaper for the homeless. Please help me welcome Richard Longworth. Thank you for coming here. Jim, thank you. It's fun to be here. Um, looking out at the audience to see if I see any friends. The, uh, um, I'm from Boone originally, and some of my friends were talking about coming here, and then it turned out that this conflicted with a get-together that they have about once every month at the TikTok to talk about old times. So it was a choice between me and the Bud Light, and I suspect I lost out. <laughs> I have some sympathy for that. But it is fun to be here. It's an honor to be back here again, just about a year after I was last here, to take part in this globalization class and also to join in the program on Iowa's place in the global community, sponsored by the Center for Excellence in the Arts and Humanities. Um, as I said, I was here about a year ago to talk about a lot of these issues, really about the impact of globalization on Iowa and on our whole Midwest, about how we are not coping very well with this impact, and to make some suggestions about what we could do about it. So what I hope to do tonight is take all this and then try to bring it up to date. <clears throat> We're talking about the future, the real future of the Midwest here, so consider this something of a progress report. Now since I was last here, a few interesting things have happened. First, we've elected a Midwesterner as president, and he's given good jobs to a lot of other Midwesterners. So now for a change, when the Midwest phones Washington, somebody there is going to be there to answer the phone. More to the point, President Obama spent a year campaigning in virtually every town in Iowa. I expect a lot of you here tonight may have had your picture taken with him. And he has real knowledge on the ground of this region of what's going on here. Second, as you all know only too well, we've tumbled into an economic crisis, probably the worst financial collapse since the Great Depression. Here in the Midwest, this crisis is probably going to finish off much of what's left of the old Midwestern economy. But crises and catastrophes do concentrate the mind. Denial is no longer an option. 
When you hit bottom, you've got two choices. Either turn out the lights or reinvent yourself into something new, something innovative and competitive. Even before the crisis hit, a lot of Midwesterners were thinking hard about these new challenges, including global challenges, and how to meet them. I think that what's going on now may be the jolt, the good swift kick that we all needed to reinvent ourselves, to reinvent this Midwest, possibly with a little help from our old friends now living in Washington. So tonight I'd like to talk about some of these main issues of globalization in the Midwest and then look at some of the things that have been happening here over the past year and go on to where we seem to be heading and what we can do to speed up and deepen this process. One theme that I'm going to be coming back to is the need for cooperation and collaboration in meeting the challenge. There's a real sense of isolation here in the Midwest, a kind of an ornery refusal to cooperate with the folks next door or the folks across the state line in the next state. Once upon a time, when Iowa really did compete with Minnesota, or when Iowa State really did compete with Iowa U, back when we had enough good jobs to go around, jobs that supported the middle class way of life, this competitiveness may have made some sense, but it doesn't now. The real competition is 10,000 miles away. Too many Midwestern places, too many Midwestern towns, cities, and states are trying to fight this battle on their own, and in this great, big, globalized world, they're simply too small to get the job done. In the process, we're losing our industries, we're losing our jobs, we're losing especially our best young people. What we've been doing isn't working, and we have to start thinking of something better. <clears throat> Basically, what I found in driving around the Midwest over the past three years, in talking with men and women who live with this impact every day, every day is that globalization is turning this region inside out. Now, part of this, of course, is about economics. Globalization, after all, is at root an economic phenomenon, but it's more than that. Economics is basically money. It's what we do for a living, how we earn our livings. It's whether we have enough money to, as people to get married or pay off college bills or have kids or be able to retire. It's also whether we have the means as communities to do the good things, the housing and the parks and safe streets and good schools that make our towns attractive places to live. It may be economics, but it determines how we work and how we live and how we think. Now, everything that I found out in doing my research is that we here in the Midwest are flunking this challenge. From our biggest cities to our smallest towns and rural areas, we're not coping very well with globalization, not making it work for us instead of against us. Somewhere, the Midwest has lost its way. Once we were the industrial and agricultural heart of the nation, now, too much of the Midwest finds itself on the wrong side of the American tracks. None of this was inevitable, but our recovery isn't inevitable either. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, and we have to abandon old habits of competitiveness and do this work together. Now, I'll come back to all this later, but first I'd like to describe some of the transformation of this very big and very important Midwestern part of our American nation. Now, I want to say right up front that you're not going to get any anti-globalization tirade from me tonight. Globalization is here, and it's not going to go away. We can't raise the drawbridge, we can't stop the world and get off, even if some days we'd kind of like to. Globalization is the present, and it's the future. And saying it's bad or good is like saying that the last big economic wave, which was the Industrial Age, was bad or good. It was good for some people, and it was bad for others. And once we got the hang of it, it was really good for the Midwest. It's hard to remember now, but we were the Silicon Valley of the industrial era, the wellspring of all the ideas and innovations that made 20th century America tick and it made us rich. That era created Midwestern industry and Midwestern farming and Midwestern cities and Midwestern railroads and Midwestern education. For all its raw power and labor battle and pollutions, the industrial age was very, very good for the Midwest, and now it's gone. The age of globalization is here. Iowa knows this, I think, but it's much more than just a local or a state problem. It's a Midwestern, a regional problem. We have new challenges from places and people that we never had to pay any attention to before, and all my studies show that we aren't doing a very good job of it. 
you want a definition of globalization, Google on it sometime. There's hundreds and thousands of definitions that will pop up. But basically, I think for our purposes, globalization means that we're in a global competition, not just with the South or California anymore, with Europe or Japan, but with the entire world, with factory workers in China and office workers in India, and yes, with farmers in Brazil. I want to stress that all of this is really new. China, Russia, and the other former communist countries have joined our economy in the past 20 years or so. India has been a major player for maybe a decade. All the technology that makes globalization possible, the internet and the web and Netscape and communication satellites and fiber optics, almost all of this is younger than the students here in this class. Most of us younger than today's Iowa State freshmen. Something like three billion new workers have joined our economy in the past two decades, and they compete with us every hour and every day. Now, since most of them came from relatively poor countries, they didn't bring a whole lot of new money with them. So this means we've got three times as many workers competing for roughly the same amount of money. So no wonder the squeeze is on wages and costs and doing things as cheaply and as efficiently as possible. Now, what does this mean for the Midwest? I'll try to summarize the effects before getting on to what we can do about it. Cities are part of this story. My own city of Chicago has made the transition, more or less, from industrial behemoth to global city. Some other cities, like Minneapolis, or yes, like Des Moines, which had less of an industrial legacy to overcome, are also doing pretty well. But most of the other big Midwestern cities often look like they're actually dying. Places like Detroit, and Cleveland and St. Louis are strange, empty places, barely half as big as they once were, with the highest poverty rates and the highest dropout rates in the country. In Ohio, six of the seven biggest cities in Ohio, all except Columbus, each has lost more than half its people and two-thirds of its industrial jobs. Most of them have huge, impoverished inner-city populations. In Milwaukee, the unemployment rate for African-American males is no less than 70, 70 percent, which is distress any way you cut it. The same is true of smaller industrial towns and cities. The industrial age scattered these smaller factory towns across the Midwestern landscape. These were places like Waterloo or Ottumwa here in Iowa, or Decatur in Illinois, or Kokomo in Indiana, or Dayton in Ohio, all of them anchors of an, an economy or an industry that has gone away. All have lost many of the industries, the factories and the companies that supported them for a century. Newton is an example. Newton exists because of Maytag. Without Maytag, there wouldn't be a Newton, and now Maytag is gone. And Newton, like all these cities, must reinvent itself to thrive in the global era. The same is true of farming and farm towns and rural areas. As you all know, farms have been getting bigger and the rural population is smaller for decades. But globalization is speeding up this process, too, by putting farmers, like factory workers, into global competition and forcing them to be ever bigger, ever more efficient, ever more tied to the giant corporations like Cargill or ADM, which dominate the food industry. I talked with Iowa farmers who farm 10,000 or 20,000 acres. I visited a dairy in Indiana with 39,000 cows, saw egg operations in Ohio with hundreds of thousands of chickens. Everybody at Iowa State knows that this trend will continue. That as much as we rhapsodize about farmers' markets and niche farming, it's these big spreads, this mega farming, that is the real key to us feeding the world. But if you come from rural areas, you know the impact all this has had on small rural towns. These towns were all founded about 100 or 150 years ago to serve the farm families in the region to be places where the farmers could shop or go to church or have a drink or see their doctor or send their kids to school. Now, this worked pretty well when the um, average farm was about 160 acres. But now the average farm is 10 times that big or bigger. This means 10 times fewer farmers, and that means 10 times fewer customers for those small town shops, 10 times fewer worshipers of the church, 10 times fewer patients for the town doctor, 10 times fewer students in the school. You probably all know towns like this, places too far from cities to be plausible bedroom suburbs. 
These places are fighting for their very existence, and sometimes they're losing. Their railroad has gone away, so has their bank, even their grocery store. The best young people leave, and those left behind are the poor, the less educated. Even technology is against these towns. Rural residents have about a half the high-speed internet access as city people, <clears throat> and in these days, if you're not online, you're out of luck. As you know, Midwestern industry has been declining for 30 years or more since the Rust Belt days. Factory towns have been hollowing out for just about as long. And farms have been consolidating and rural populations declining for decades. But globalization is putting the final nails in these coffins. It's making these trends irreversible. I found that there's still a lot of denial out there. Many manufacturing towns think the good old days of humming factories are coming back. Many economic development people think that China will implode somehow and all those outsourced jobs will be resourced back home. A lot of small towns think that the bright kids who left 20 years ago will come back in middle age because they have families now and want a place that is safe and cheap. <clears throat> got to tell you, it's not going to happen. China's got a good deal and it's not going to give it up. Midwestern factories are still turning out the goods but with a lot fewer workers. Midwestern farming, too, is as productive as ever, but modern technology enables individual farmers to farm ever bigger spreads. And those bright, educated, creative kids that we're, that we're exporting to the cities have really good jobs there now, jobs that enable them to put their brains and their education to use, and it's going to take more than fresh air and low-cost housing to bring them back. I think a key point to remember here is the fact that almost any place you can think of, any town or city you can think of, from Paris to London to Chicago, down to the smallest farming village, each of them was founded for some economic purpose. As a trading post, or a farm town, or mining town, as a port or a factory town. Almost every place in history began life as a labor pool, as a place where people came together to work. And then over the years, they became more than a labor pool. They created houses and schools and churches, stores and museums, became a city, and then a civilization, but all fueled by that economy. But in economics, nothing lasts forever. The mine plays out, or the port silts up, or the factory goes away, or we learn how to farm more land with ever fewer farmers. And when this happens, the town or city loses its original economic reason for existence. The great cities of history are those that have found new economic purpose, that have reinvented themselves often time and again. Those that can't do this won't disappear exactly, the earth isn't going to open up and swallow them, but they'll become backwaters. Shrinking cities, sometimes picturesque places like Venice, sometimes destitute places like Detroit, shut out of the global conversation. The point is that the Midwest, all the Midwest, from Ohio through Iowa, does two big things for a living, which are intensive farming and heavy industry, and globalization has come along and has tossed both of them right up in the air. These cha this challenges the very economic purpose, and hence the civilization, not just of Midwestern towns and cities, but of the region itself. When I talk about the need for us to reinvent ourselves, to be the kind of place where creative people want to live, this is what I mean. Now, I realize a lot of this is pretty grim, but I don't apologize. The South went through a bad century between the Civil War and the invention of air conditioning. My Chicago Cubs are going through a bad century right now. And I think it's vital that we recognize that the Midwest faces this fate unless we do something about it. The good news is that there is something we can do about it, quite a lot, in fact. And I'd like to spend the rest of my time tonight suggesting some of the things that we can do. First is to zero in on the industries of the future and make them our own. One of these is bioscience and biotech, the industry of turning plants and animals into drugs, medical devices, biofuels, chemicals, new substances, and many other things that go way beyond food. Now, if anybody knows plants and animals, it's us here in the Midwest. And there's no excuse for the fact that the big bio firms now are on the two coasts, not here. Another industry, of course, is sustainable energy and green technology. These energies and technologies have gone suddenly from being an obsession of tree huggers to being a real force in the economy. 
What we're talking about here is mostly energy from wind and sun, and again, the Midwest has all this in abundance. New research into the storing and transmission of this energy is going to turn this into very big business, and we should be in on the ground floor. There's a manufacturing aspect to this, too. Most parts for solar panels and most parts for wind turbines are imported now from overseas, and there's no reason why we can't make them right here. Nanotech, another big wave of the future, the manipulation of subatomic particles to make newer, stronger, lightweight materials. Research into nano is going on now in places like Ohio and Michigan that made cars and car parts. Again, they know materials, so they can build on this knowledge. Now, I know I'm standing here in the middle of a big research university, where work on all these industries of the future is going on, and I'm not telling you all anything you don't already know. But this is where this business of collaboration, of cooperation, of getting beyond our Midwestern orneriness comes in. I sense that more and more people <clears throat> are ready to start thinking about this, about going beyond traditional political and jurisdictional boundaries to really get something done. As I mentioned, there's still a lot of denial out there. But at the same time, a lot of the Midwest has stopped kidding itself. I think people realize that this time really is different, that the old economy that supported us so well for a century is going and gone, that a new economy is here, and the old ways of doing things won't work anymore. You get two different responses to what's going on. I went, for instance, to Elkhart, Indiana, where they make RVs. As you know, the RV market is really in the tank. But everybody there told me that, hey, you know, it's okay. We've been down before, and the RV market has always come back, and it'll happen again. And the fact is that it probably will come back. It just won't come back quite as high as it was before, and the next dip will be a little bit lower. And as long as they hold on to the old industry, there's no future for Elkhart. But then I went to Janesville, Wisconsin, <clears throat> where the economy centered on a big GM plant, 2,500 workers. Well, that plant closed this year, and GM even sent a vice president out to tell Janesville, don't hope against hope, GM wasn't coming back. Janesville got the message, and they're thinking hard about new industries based on alternative energy, and about enlisting local colleges in the effort, and about working with other towns and counties, including across the state line in Rockford, Illinois, which has problems of its own. Peoria, Illinois almost hit bottom 15 years ago after a couple of ruinous strikes involving the UAW and the big local employer, which is Caterpillar. Caterpillar could have left town like Maytag did. Instead, the city decided to do things differently, to bring the town's warring factions together to try to save the place. This involves cooperation between businesses, including Caterpillar, and Bradley University, which never played that much of a civic role before, and a really good community college, and the U.S. Department of Ag Lab, which is aiming its research towards job-creating businesses. The UAW is involved in this, too. So is the city government, which has a seat at the table, but has not been asked to take the lead. <clears throat> this is an example of cooperation locally among people who aren't that much used to working together. Elsewhere, people are beginning to work across state and county lines. Cleveland and Pittsburgh are talking about creating a joint economic region, possibly with a two-city airport in the middle. Milwaukee has practically seceded mentally from the state of Wisconsin and sees its future as part of the greater Chicago economic region. Uh, Detroit has been kidding itself for years, pretending that the auto industry would never go away, and there's still a lot of that thinking going on, which is one of Detroit's problems. But a Southeast Michigan initiative has been set up to try to find a future beyond cars for the city and for the counties around it. Midwestern states spend a lot more time, spend a lot more time trying to steal business from each other than cooperating. But even these states are beginning to reach out. The Midwest states have just signed an accord aimed at preserving Great Lakes water. Midwest governors are cooperating in a project to create jobs through renewable energy projects. The same governments have signed an agreement laying out climate change goals. In some places, wealthy families who traditionally gave their money to symphonies or hospitals are setting up projects deliberately focused on economic development and job creation. In Grand Rapids, Michigan, for instance, the auto and furniture industries have pretty well left town. So two local families, the families that created Amway, have pumped millions into medical research with the result that there's a medical mile in the middle of Grand Rapids 
hospitals and institutes devoted to research, spinning off new businesses and jobs based on that research. A good local college, Grand Valley, opened a campus downtown, but Grand Rapids lacked a key ingredient, which was a really good research university. So it talked Michigan State into hiving off part of its medical school and moving it bodily down to that medical mile. <clears throat> the same thing is going on in Kansas City with the Stowers Institute. Set up by a husband and wife, the Stowers, investment bankers, both cancer survivors, to do cancer research. In St. Louis, money from the Danforth family has set up the Danforth Center, devoted to bioscience research, in cooperation with Washington University in St. Louis, plus Monsanto and other local companies. They've, they've created an intellectual center that may change the future of tired old St. Louis. Local money can go in other imaginative directions. You're probably all familiar with Kalamazoo of Michigan, the Kalamazoo Promise, where local, local philanthropists offered a four-year ride to any state college or university for all graduates of the local Kalamazoo High School. Kalamazoo had been having its problems, but this offer brought a flood of people moving back into town so their kids could go to the high school. This in turn led to a housing boom plus the opening of stores to serve the new residents. The fact is that many Midwestern towns have wealthy families whose money is sitting idle right now. Someday, that money is going to go to sons or daughters who long ago left town to live in New York or Los Angeles, a wealth transfer that leaves the town just that much poorer. All Iowa towns should be thinking now how to spot this money and how to persuade its owners to use it for the permanent benefit of the towns where they spent their lives. Even universities are beginning to get the picture. This is crucial. Between the Big Ten and the land-grant universities like Ohio State and private schools like the University of Chicago and big research centers like the Mayo Clinic, the Midwest commands more intellectual firepower than any region in the world, including the Ivy League. Put it all together and we could rule the future. But the problem is we never put it all together. All these universities compete as fiercely for faculty and research and grants as their football teams do on Saturdays. So all this brain power be ends up being so much than the, the sum of the, less than the sum of its parts in terms of what it could really contribute to the Midwestern economy. This goes on between these warring Midwestern states and it goes on within states too, as anybody knows who has tried to get Iowa State and Iowa U and Northern Iowa to cooperate on anything. The good news is that this is changing too. Indiana is trying to merge its business skills with the engineering talent up the highway at uh, Purdue. The president of Michigan State is talking about making the European Union a sort of template for the Midwest. The Big Ten schools have been meeting to try to see how they can deepen their cooperation. Some of this new spirit of cooperation is even taking hold here in Iowa, which is as Midwestern and hence as ornery as any state in the nation. Towns like Newton, that once made big old appliances for a living, are now making wind turbine parts instead, grabbing a toehold, not much more than that so far, in sustainable energy. The Quad Cities have been divided for years by much more than the Mississippi River, but they're getting together to market themselves and try to behave like the one big economic region that they really are. They're even talking about setting up a larger economic region that was stretched from Cedar Rapids across the river all the way to Peoria. The Obama administration is putting a lot of money into community colleges, and here in Iowa, these colleges have agreed to start creating a joint statewide working training program to provide workers for renewable energy jobs. Now, as you may have noticed, a lot of this is still talk. Not much action so far. But there does seem to be a realization that last that we're all in this together. There's a recognition that this new world needs cooperation between research universities and community colleges and businesses and state and local governments. There's an understanding that great universities must truly work together on research, even merging schools, to give us a leg up in those new bio and nano industries. Each state must stop supporting its own bio organization and instead pursue bio on a regional basis. We have to go beyond the small state-based venture capital funds and instead create a regional fund with the money to really finance the good ideas coming out of our universities. And each state has to stop competing with the others for investment 
the so-called smokestack chasing, <clears throat> and recognize that anything that benefits any part of the Midwest will benefit it all. After all, we rose together as a region during the Industrial Age, and we're declining together now. If we're going to make a comeback, it's going to be a Midwestern comeback. The goal of all this, the end result, is good jobs. Good jobs are the only thing that will both attract and keep the smart, educated, creative people that the Midwest needs to build this future. Iowa State, like all good Midwestern universities, is a magnet from students from all over the country and all over the world. It's giving a world-class education to the citizens of the future, some of them right here in this room tonight. But too many of those students, those citizens, are taking their brains and their education to the coasts or the big cities because that's where the jobs are. It's not enough to be a cheap or safe place to live. The people, the ones who will build the future, are less interested, interested in saving money than in being part of this new exciting economy and helping to shape this new future. This future, this world can take shape any place. Right now, it's not taking shape here. All over the Midwest, people are waking up to this, are asking the right questions, are looking for the right answers. We here in the Midwest face a new challenge, which is no less than to rebuild not just our economy, but our civilization. There are people here in this room tonight who can get this job done. I do hope that you will take this on as the challenge of your lifetime, and I wish you well. Thank you very much. Do we have some time for back and forth? Sure. What, what we need to uh, pass microphones to people because we have an off-campus contingent. So okay. we have folks raise their hand, give them the mic, and then they talk to you. Questions? Jim? Where is it? Well, all right. Um, I have to say that I grew up in a small town in North Dakota, and so I did read your book, and uh, it had a great effect on me. And I guess just coming from a small town myself, I, I have to ask a question. Uh, do you think that it's worthwhile in a globalized economy to be protecting our small towns, to revitalize them, or do you see us turning into a country of globalization centers? Um, just what, what is the future of small town America, in your opinion? Boy, if you ask the $64,000 question, the answer is that nobody knows now. The point I was making is that every place has to have an economic purpose. You know, maybe artificial capitals like Washington or Brasilia are exceptions, but every place else has to earn its living. And if these small towns, or if these big cities like Detroit, can't earn their living anymore, have no more economic purpose, cannot reinvent themselves economically, then no, there is no future. If you go around the Midwest, you see lots of places that used to be towns. I spent a very instructive afternoon once a few years ago going to Bethlehem and New York, which are two, were, past tense, two little towns down in southeastern Iowa, just a few miles from each other, that once held about two, 3,000 people, had stores, churches, schools, the whole thing. Now there's nothing in Bethlehem or New York except a church surrounded by cornfields. And for a lot of these towns, the, um, you know, that, that, that could be the future. There are people who are worrying a lot about this, who are trying to leverage local wealth, who are trying to encourage <clears throat> local economic development people and chambers of commerce to stop spending a lot of money recruiting industry from outside, trying to draw in businesses, do the smokestack chasing, do the competition that, where the odds are much against you, and instead invest that money in local schools, in local community colleges to work on entrepreneurialism, to try and get local banks to invest money, to try to set up some sort of angel capital or venture capital funds that can create jobs there and uh, that will keep people there. I think I mentioned in the book, my mother's hometown out in Woodbine, Harrison County, Western Iowa. There's one guy in town, he invented a, invented a hydraulic lift for pickup trucks. 
put up a factory, 50 jobs in a town like Woodbine, that's enough to be a force in the economy. So some of these towns, if they can get their act together, if they can encourage local entrepreneurialism, then I think um, these, these towns may have a future. It's going to have to come from people that these towns have never looked to before. There's a great dream, generally, that somebody who's made his pile in Chicago or New York or Minneapolis is going to come back home and set up a company there. And uh, this generally doesn't happen. There's a good book coming out next month. It's called Hollowing Out the Middle by two professors from Philadelphia who spent a year and a half living in a little town in northeastern Iowa. They don't say which town, they call it Ellis, but that's a, that's a pseudonym. But their point is that almost all of these small Midwestern towns, and not so small towns, put all their emphasis on the favored kids in town, teachers, parents, friends, everybody in town, the bright kids, the lead, future leaders are singled out very early on and given all the encouragement in the world, including encouragement to leave. The towns know that these students are going to leave and they're going to go out in the world and the town will be very proud of them, but they're not going to see them again. But in the meantime, those who stay behind, the ones who are not going to go on to college, get shortchanged. Um, I can remember this, you know, from when I was a kid in Boone, but the thing is, that the ones who didn't go to college, the ones who stayed in Boone, there are a lot of good industrial, agricultural related jobs there. And my classmates led perfectly good lives. Globalization, the outsourcing process, has taken away the jobs that these small towns relied on. This is the impact of globalization on these small towns, that they aren't there anymore. So that, that's a long-winded answer to your question, which is that the future for these places is not guaranteed. Nobody's promised them anything. Good evening. I have not read your book, but I listened to your lecture and took some notes. One thing that I, right now, tonight, I hear that is missing from your plans is individuality. The problem with globalism, we had a lecture from someone from the Des Moines Register describing about how she thinks it's wonderful that we are breaking down borders and she has no allegiance to any flag and multiculturalism is everything and blah, 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 you know. I don't see globalism as doing anything but destroying America and I think you've kind of indicated that. We haven't cooperated with ourselves to be able to put up any kind of cooperation within our immediate area. But I think that one of the things we need is to be able to let people know, for example, these universities that are conflicting with each other, or cities that are vying against each other, is that they have to be able to know they can keep their individual identity and control over their own circumstances while cooperating with others in their regional area. I've, thought, I've come to the conclusion that it's going to be local government and regional, immediate regional cooperation. Those combining will then interlink with the others that are cooperating and not fighting against each other because otherwise we'll lose it. And that's partly, I think, what you're saying is we have to cooperate. But letting the individual cities and others have their, their identity is kind of important. Otherwise, we end up being like the world. They, some people want us to have all just one common color, one common face. Mm -hmm. And it's this, the natural diversity, not an imposed diversity, that is important in this. And I think that's something that kind of has to be strong. In the, in the effort is uh, let them know that they're not going to have to give up themselves to be able to be a success. Does that make sense? To you? That makes a lot of sense. It is, um, people hate to give up this individuality or this perceived individuality even when it makes sense to cooperate with somebody next door. Anybody who's been involved in the consolidation of two rural school districts knows, knows this. Um, they had a um, referendum once down in the Quad Cities to try and go into Quad Cities. I, I was fascinated to find out there's actually five Quad Cities. I don't know what this says about Midwestern math, but there you are. <laughs> but there was a referendum to try and turn this area, which really is one big economic area, apart from the river, you can't tell where one town ends and the other begins, turned into one city, and it failed miserably. 
because people felt, you know, you mean I can't root for my Bettendorf Tigers anymore, that, that sort of thing. There is a local identity. Um, this is natural, and you have to get around it. The European Union has managed to merge a lot of its economic activities, has managed to get a lot of border, uh, trans, trans border cooperation going to their overall and mutual benefit, while still remaining individual countries, most of them speaking different languages, until recently with different uh, currencies, um, a lot of them with different tax systems. They all have their national football teams and national soccer teams by which they live and die. And you know, if, you know, if the British fans are there, they literally die about this sort of thing. They don't. They don't have. To, they don't have to give this up. They have their own. Uh, um, <coughs> still, their individuality. They do feel that they've lost something. That some of the control over their lives has gone away to Brussels, and they've lost this. Some of the control over the decision making, especially in the economic area. Um, this may be inevitable, and I don't know what you can do about it because it is a serious human and a political problem. All of us, all of us here in the Midwest, in farm towns, industrial towns, university towns, this sort of thing, we grew up as part of first a state economy, and then a regional economy, and then a national economy. Um, if you've read uh, William Cronin's wonderful book, Nature's Metropolis, it's how the Midwest created Chicago, and Chicago created the Midwest. There's this terrific symbiosis be between Chicago and its hinterland. So everybody here fit in to a larger economy. We were parts in that economy. Okay, the economy has changed. It's not a national economy. It's not a regional economy. It's a global economy. How do we fit into that while keeping our individuality? But how do we fit into that? Because if we don't fit into it, we do lose this, you know, our, our means of making our living, and we dwindle away, a high price to pay for individuality. You talked about uh, we need to, like, someone think that small towns need to do is create jobs to preserve that small town. Beg pardon? You talked about how small towns need to create jobs or kind of industries or something special so people stay back. Um, as like a young graduate that's, or a young student that's going to graduate shortly, it's hard to find jobs within small towns, whereas like there's more opportunities in big cities. Um, but at the same time, it's hard for towns to create that jobs for those young individuals when they know the individuals are going to look for that opportunities. So it's kind of, it seems risky for towns to take that risk, hoping that people will come. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? Like, how, how does that process work? Or how can they go about doing that? Like, finding a solution for it. What I'm saying, a lot of what I talked about tonight is not anything that is um, going to be solved by the start of winter quarter. This is a long-term process. We are about now in this whole stage of globalization where the industrial age was when James Watt first began tinkering with steam engine 2.0. Um, it took us 100, 150 years to work out the political and economic and social and human implications of the industrial age. And now we've got to do it all over again. So what I'm saying is these towns have got to start thinking about this now, realizing that there's not going to be any short-term payoff. You're absolutely right in the diagnosis. There is a um, report out, I expect a lot of you have seen it, called uh, Generation Iowa Commission, which is talking about the brain drain from Iowa, but they could be talking about the rest of the Midwest too. Every Midwestern state is bleeding its smartest, best educated people. Everybody, every state except Illinois and Minnesota, but that's accounted for totally by Chicago and the Twin Cities. The rest of Illinois and Minnesota are losing <clears throat> their smartest people uh, as, as much as any other state. This report noted that the universities in Iowa are among the most successful in the nation in drawing in students from around the country and around the world. It noted that of all the college age, college age kids in Iowa, fully 33% of them are actually enrolled in post-secondary education, which isn't bad. It also noted that when you project jobs in Iowa, only 12% of them are going to require a college education. 
which means that the colleges and universities in Iowa are educating students for jobs that don't exist in Iowa. That's what has to be turned around. It's not only um, in small towns, but it's everywhere. And I'm talking about Iowa, but I could be talking about Michigan or Indiana or downstate Illinois or anywhere. Kind of leading into that, I actually had a question that dealt almost exactly with education, but bringing in a different theme that you talked about in your book. Um, just kind of summarizing what you just said, there tends to be a lot of brain drain from Midwestern states to the coasts. Um, you also talk about in your book about how um, in some cases our um, primary and secondary education is not the best in the Midwest. Um, now tying this together, you also talk about how uh, immigration to the Midwest is saving some small towns um, and really truly be like new life buff for these towns. But in the same vein, you also talk about how a lot of immigrants who do come to this country um, are not as well educated and they don't necessarily allow their, or really emphasize for their children how important education is and it puts a bunch of different strains on communities and whatnot. In some ways, how does, how, what are the impacts then of that, of uh, the immigration then coming in, into the Midwest? I mean, are we gonna see in the future immigrants eventually becoming more educated and then moving back out again? Or is this kind of like a temporary, or is immigration kind of a temporary uh, solution to our long-term problems? Uh. I have so many questions. I mean, this involves looking into the future, which I cannot do. But you are absolutely right that um, any place that is successful, that's having success, um, is drawing immigrants. Immigrants are both a cause and an effect of success. Uh, immigrants come to a place because they hear there are jobs there, because there's a lively economy, because there's something going on. Somebody phones home and says, you all come, and they, and they do. And once there, then they often create jobs and spur the economy on. At the moment, especially with the, I mean, there's two kinds of immigration, of course. I mean, you have your PhDs from China and India and Pakistan and other countries like that. And any immigration policy that we have, like the one we have right now, that discourages these students from coming and discourages from staying is absolutely nuts. I mean, we're just shooting ourselves in the foot. But the larger flood of immigration is the Hispanic immigration <clears throat> coming up from the South. At the moment, this is injecting a tremendous amount of vitality into the Midwestern economy. It's not exactly creating good jobs or high-level salaries. I spent a good deal of time up in um, Storm Lake, um, where, which is one of the few towns up in northwestern Iowa that is actually growing or you know, holding its own because they've got a lot of Mexican immigrants, especially coming to work in the meatpacking plants. These are bad jobs, but they, um, they are jobs. So Storm Lake is surviving because of these immigrants. At the same time, the average wage in Storm Lake has been going down over the years. I had people there tell me that it's now one of the poorest towns per capita in the um, uh, state. Um, so the immigrants have not saved Storm Lake by any means. This is where we're at right now. The, we have, in a smaller town, schools are working with immigrant children to keep them into school with a good deal of success. In the larger cities like Chicago, we have something like a 50% dropout rate among uh, Mexican high school students, and it's driving us nuts. We don't know what to do about it. We don't know how to get parents involved. We don't know how to keep the kids in the school. We, um, you know, the idea of lengthening the school day or lengthening the school week to keep more of them actually in the building to encourage studying like this. You know, I, the work we have to do with parents to encourage their kids in, to stay in school. That just hasn't hit home yet. There are an awful lot of good jobs, or there have been up until the recession, in landscaping and construction and tourism and restaurants and things like that. Um, <clears throat> jobs that don't take a lot of education but pay a whole lot better than what they're earning back home. And so that, that is where that stands. Um, beyond that, we have not found a solution to the problems that you mentioned. Sorry. I have a question. Um, actually, um, this is from an off-campus student who emailed earlier, and it's wonderful to have one of the authors of the books that the students are reading um, in the 
you know, in the house tonight. And so the question is that we would love to hear you give your opinion about your views on globalization, how they would compare and contrast to those of the other authors that we're reading, such as Robert Reich and uh, Greenwald and Kahn. Um, uh, and I think a lot of the students would be interested in hearing your opinion about that. <laughs> Uh, that sounds like I've got to give about three or four book reviews here. Um, it all differs. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Tom Friedman fan, and that I think Tom has done a wonderful job of popularizing a subject that desperately needs popularization. A lot of people read his books <clears throat> and understand what's going on. I think he's a little bit too gaga about the future, that it's all going to be great. Um, other people say that um, it is going to steal our individuality, or it's going to undermine our economy, or there's no way that we can possibly compete with people around the world, that we can't create these new industries. And again, on that, on bio and nano and all that, like everything else, the jury is still out. We don't know how many jobs these are going to create. I'd say my point is, um, or of agnostic on this. A globalization is here. We can close ourselves off and turn ourselves into a great big Burma, but that's, that's not what we can do. We are too involved with it already. So we have to somehow make it work, but the first thing we have to do is simply to realize this here, that the old days are gone forever, that a lot of what the Midwest, at any rate, and I'm not talking about the rest of the country, but a lot of what the Midwest did, some of what it still does, <clears throat> can be done just about as well and a whole lot cheaper somewhere else, and we're silly if we try to hold on to this, and then try to reinvent ourselves into something that can be competitive in this new world, because this new world is not going to um, go away. Um, Beyond that, all, all I've got to su suggest is various ways we can do this. One thing that I have suggested is that having realized that the past is gone, having cut ourselves off from the past, having said we can't do the past anymore, then we build on the past. And what I mean by that is we look at what we know, we look at what we're good at, and try to build on that. I was down in the Quad Cities, and I was saying, what, what do you want to do? What sort of future do you want? And they say, oh, bioscience would be very good. And I said, you know anything about bioscience? Do you have any background in that? No. What do you know? Well, we got the river, and we got the highways, and we got the railroads, and I said, logistics. Um, you know, this, this is one of the big industries of the future because it's something they are good at. Akron, Ohio the auto tire capital of the world. Uh, they don't make tires there anymore. They make a few specialty racing tires and that's it. But they know polymers. They know the molecules that go into making rubber and a lot of other stuff. And in cooperation between the auto companies, most of them still have operations there, and smaller companies in the city, and especially the University of Akron, they have the start on a pretty good polymers industry, small companies using polymers for new products. One of my favorite examples is a guy there who has figured out a way of diagnosing back diseases using a gel based on polymers. In Peoria, they um, used to be a big whiskey making town, Hiram Walker. Well, they don't make whiskey there anymore, but as they say in Peoria, we know fermentation, which is bio, and they are, they've got to start between Caterpillar, ADM, this U.S. Department of Ag, Ag Lab, uh, some of the other companies there, a, uh, Bradley setting up a big incubator building. They are trying to take what they know, what they're good at, and <clears throat> build uh, the future on that. I think it's necessary for the Midwest to try to figure out what it knows. There are certain things, I think probably um, high-tech computers, um, silicon chips, things like that, we probably lost that race. That's, that's not our comparative advantage. But there are things that we are good at that, that uh, apply to the future if we, if we apply ourselves. Um, I don't know if that is an answer. It's just that I am not inclined to say that globalization is good 
or that's bad, or we ought to dive in with both feet, or that we ought to just have nothing to do with it. I don't think any of that's realistic. If globalization has a moral function, and I think it's done, it does, it's its ability to lift hundreds of millions, even billions of people around the world up to something remotely resembling the kind of economic decency that we here in the first world have known for so many years. And that's happening. But the big question is how do you do this without doing it on the backs of American workers? And that one we haven't figured out yet. Thank you. I'm actually going to go back a little bit on, on the immigration issue since globalization is a, you know, I guess, as you say, the mass migration of people is a big part of this uh, globalized, uh, uh, you know, world. Um, what would you think is, would be good for um, the state government, in, in this case with Iowa, to adopt long-term policies that actually send a message of welcome, uh, welcoming message, embracing these new, these new populations coming into the state, as opposed to some politicians taking a short-term uh, standing on anti-immigrant policies, you know, without considering that immigration is actually a need for many rural communities for survival, economic survival. Um, this, this is a uh, political time bomb, as you know. Tom Vilsack tried to do that. And he got his head handed to him for his, for his troubles. He tried to turn Iowa into the Ellis Island, Island of the Midwest, and uh, there's terrific uh, <clears throat> backlash. One thing that Iowa can just, did Iowa, tell me, I don't know, did Iowa ever get around to repealing that vote, making English the official language of the state? Is that still on the books? Well, get rid of that one for a starter. Otherwise, I'm not so sure what states can do. Um, it is a political hot button. I don't think you're going to get the political support to say, y'all come. You just shouldn't get in the way. States too often, not only Iowa, but a lot of other states, when you get into state governments, state governments get in the way. They put up restrictions on things. Uh, try to keep the state governments out of it, and then the immigrants will come. If you have the economy here that draws immigrants, they'll come. If you have the kind of jobs and vitality that immigrants want to fill, they are going to come. Um, nobody in Chicago went down to Mexico and recruited Mexicans to come north and live in Chicago, but somehow we got a million and a half of them and they've re simply revitalized, literally saved our city. <clears throat> um, but we, we didn't have to have any policies. Now, once they're here, that's when the policies kick in. I think this has to be largely local. You have, they have to be educated. They are mostly working. Welfare is not a huge part of this. Healthcare is a big part, working with local hospitals, uh, getting paramedics in, getting nurse practitioners, getting Spanish-speaking um, <clears throat> medical personnel is very important. Um, working with the other police, police departments, have to be sensitized uh, to this. Um, but th this is a local thing. I really don't think um, states are much good at this because uh, so much of the opposition to immigrants comes from places that don't have any. It's not the towns in Iowa that had immigrants. It's not the Marshall towns or the, uh, you know, the Denison's or the Sioux cities or places like that that had immigrants that led the backlash against immigration, even though some of these places seem to go out and re-elect Steve King every two years. But it is the places that don't have immigrants, who are scared of immigrants, who have a certain image of Iowa, which is European and white and formed over the past 150, 200 years, and they're very afraid of losing that. Places where immigrants are are too, are too busy getting on with the job to, um, to get too steamed up about this. Who are uh, guests, um, you're welcome to ask questions. Please do. We value you as part of our, our course. And uh, if you have questions, 
please raise your hand and we'll, we'll pretend you're young again. It seems uh, education is the root solution to the problems in the economy. <clears throat> Why is there not a push to improve education and make it more financially accessible to um, people in the U.S.? Um, where are you? I didn't see. Oh, there we are. Um, <laughs> about two or three hours worth of answers to that one. <clears throat> um, like so much else, we are suddenly beginning to wake up to the fact that the way we have educated our people in the past just won't do anymore. Um, the way the Midwest has educated its students, ever since the Morrill Act, ever since the Land Grant Act of when, 1868, has been to give a really good university education to the minority of students who are going to go out and run the economy and give quite a good high school education to everybody else. And that basically is what we still do. It's, it's the old pattern. We haven't got out of that. We give a good education to a minority of students in an era when the majority of students are going to need at least two years of post-secondary education if they're ever going to hold a decent job in their lives. And we haven't gotten around to this. Now, I think that two years is crucial. I'm a big fan of what the Obama administration is trying to do and the $12 billion they've committed to community colleges. Everywhere I go and find a lively local community, I know I'm going to find a really good community college at the center of it. Community colleges, I think, as much as universities, are really key to this. Universities have got to come up with the ideas and the research that are going to create this new economy, but it's the community colleges that are going to produce the workers who are going to make a tick. I think there's also an awful lot of entrepreneurialism there. Um, money is going to be a huge problem. I think I pointed out in the books that uh, most Midwestern states, in fact states everywhere, are simply shortchanging the universities that bear their name. Um, the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor now gets 7% of its operating expenses from the state of Michigan. Back in the year 2000, um, the state government in Iowa supplied 35% of the operating expenses for the three regents universities. That's down in about eight or nine years to about half, about 18% now, and shrinking fast. States have so many other demands on their resources, including taking care of repairing the damage from this disappearing economy, that education seems to have fallen pretty well down the um, scale. This is going to leave it up to universities to find new ways of raising money, which probably means closer ties with corporations, more research contracts, more emphasis on um, <clears throat> uh, graduate education, that sort of thing. Um, undergrad education, especially if the freshman and sophomore years, is probably going to move more towards smaller colleges, if they can afford to do it, or to community colleges, which is where a lot of the funding ought to go. Um, I think you mentioned in there something about K-12. None of this makes any sense at all unless we can do some, unless we can turn out students from high schools who are capable of doing post-secondary work. Um, vast percentage of graduates, especially in cities, once out of high school and going on to some sort of post-secondary education, need remedial work. And of those, I think the figures are something like one in eight or one or ten come out actually able to do post-secondary work. In other words, remedial is not the answer. Secondary uh, K-12 <laughs> has to be reformed. What we're talking about is a shakeup in education right from early childhood education up to um, post-grad. And it's something we are just beginning to think about, this whole question of how we finance education has not begun to surface yet. You go to any university, I expect you've all heard around here, I know that when I go someplace and talk about the privatization of public education, people nod their heads. This seems to be a debate that's going on in university campuses, but it's not a debate that has moved out into the public realm yet.
Um, yeah, some of the things I mentioned here tonight. There is a, um, the community colleges in Iowa, notoriously competitive and contentious. They wouldn't have dreamed working together. They're working together now to try to create jobs in, um, in um, high-tech ener energy industries. They're, they've really got a program going, and I think they're getting somewhere. They are, the changes I see, I think there's a willingness not only to talk within states, but between states. This is something that just didn't happen before. I was astonished going around doing the research in my book to find out that there were people in Iowa, academics and government people and business people who knew everything there was to know about the state of Iowa, but didn't have the foggiest idea of what was going on in the state line in Illinois or Minnesota. And the same thing is true in other states too. That is breaking down. People want to talk together. There is a movement between, say, Civic foundations, we have one in Chicago called the Chicago Community Trust, which deals just with philanthropy in Chicago. There's another one, there's one here in Des Moines, there's one in Cleveland, there's one in Milwaukee. And they traditionally, by their very nature, have been locked up within their old city limits. And they're realizing now that one city can't rise while the rest are all falling. So they're beginning to work together. Um, Midwestern governors. I've got a friend who used to be a uh, governor here, a governor in the Midwest, not in Iowa, but used to be chairman of the Midwest Governors Association, and he says they never did a thing. It was really a sleepy organization. They're getting together and doing all sorts of stuff now on the environment, on high-tech energy, on trying to get programs going across state borders. Chet Culver and the other governors were in uh, Chicago just recently signing a compact on high-speed rail throughout the Midwest. This is stuff that would never have happened before. I think people are beginning to realize. As I said, so far, mostly talk. But you can see um, there, is, there is a realization that the good old days aren't going to come back. That we're not in just a little bitty economic downturn right now that will turn around once the recession ends. But that this time really is different. And uh, so, so I, I am encouraged about that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say I'm optimistic, but I'm hopeful. Um, well, your statistic you mentioned earlier in your speech about the 70% African-American male unemployment rate in Milwaukee made me think a lot about what you've said of how globalization exacerbates existing inequalities. And besides uh, what you talked about of making community college more available to everyone, what other steps do you think need to be part of these strategies to make sure that Midwest success doesn't come at the cost of even greater inequality? This again is such a huge problem. I, I mentioned Milwaukee, the Journal Sentinel up there did this study, came up with a 70% unemployment rate among uh, African-American males there. That's not just Milwaukee. You can do that anywhere. You get unemployment figures in cities, certainly in Chicago, in the inner city in Chicago. The official unemployment figure is 15 or 20 percent. Absolutely unrealistic. What they did, <clears throat> instead of just counting the people who registered as unemployed, is they go out and they figure out how many people live in a certain neighborhood or a certain area. Then they go out and it takes hard work and they find out how many people actually have jobs. They count the employed, not the unemployed, and then they subtract. And 60, 70 percent unemployment, I think, is the norm in a lot of inner city areas. These are also the same areas where you've got 50 percent dropout rates, especially among boys. <clears throat> um, these are kids who are never going to hold a decent job even a full-time job, as long as they live, and we are creating little archip an archipelago of little ghettos all across the Midwest in big cities like Detroit and Chicago and in small cities like um, Mansfield and Dayton and Ohio of um, largely African Americans who came north to work in the industries before and after World War II and now are stranded here and have been stranded for several generations once those industries went away, first to the south and now overseas. And the distance between them and the economy is just terrific. We have 
tens of thousands of people in Chicago who can stand on the west side and on a clear day see all the skyscrapers in the loop, but would have no more idea how to access that economy than they would in flying, flying to the moon. So it's, it's more than just education, it is breaking down a gap. Um, talked with a black leader in uh, Milwaukee and he just despairs because he says the schools and the neighborhoods, the African American schools and neighborhoods in Milwaukee are just so far away from anything that's going on that you can, you can improve education all you want and still you have a gap between people who are simply left out of this global conversation. We, we, we got a lot of work to do. We'll do uh, one last question right up over here. You said twice just recently that... Scott, again, uh, please. You said twice just recently that good old days are gone. But I've been an avid uh, interest in history for a long time. And I look at the reunification of Europe, the European Union, and the single monetary system, and the possible expansion to other countries in the region as being a re-emphasis of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And I also look at other efforts to unify the whole Western Hemisphere um, into a single unit. If you look back in history, colonialism was nothing but a global economy too. And you see a lot of things, of single currencies going on around the world. That's what they did. You see a lot of uh, rights taken away from citizens in different parts of the world. That's what they did under colonialism. So I think you're assuming an awful lot about the uh, goodness of the people to bring about uh, people's rights under globalization. Oh, I wouldn't. No, we ha we haven't talked about much about people's rights here tonight, and that's a whole different subject. And I don't assume anything. Um, we are now in the, the the rights you talk about are the rights that we have established and fought for and struggled for. Um, you know, for the last, certainly, well, ever since the Magna Carta, but more recently, since the Renaissance and the Reformation and the Enlightenment and all things that I'm talking about that took place mostly in the West. The rights that we enjoy were our Western rights that came up within our society and we were able to achieve them and defend them and impose them largely because we could pay for it. The guy who writes the checks gets to make the rules. And in the past 500 years, we, the West, have been able to write the checks. Economic power is moving away from here now. Economic power is moving to the East. As I said, this is raising hundreds of millions of people to new levels of economic decency can, can only be cheered. But it also means that there's going to be new people able to define our civilization, define our rights, and to defend and, imp and impose those rights. And we, this is a topic we haven't even begun to think of. I think this ties into one of the ways that this time is different, apart from the speed of communications, the speed with which all this is happening. For the first time in history, the whole flow of our economy has changed, even during colonial times and really right up till about 1990. The role of the third world was to produce raw materials and ship it to us, and we made things out of it, and when we sold it, sometimes we sold it back to them. <clears throat> but it was a division of labor, with them doing the basic stuff and us doing the more advanced stuff. Well, that's changed. More often now, we're the ones that are providing the raw materials that go to uh, China or other countries to be converted into goods and then sold back to us. This is a shift in power, it's a shift in relationship that I think is um, uh, really different and makes, makes history, um, the lessons of history, we have to draw on the lessons of history but we cannot assume that history repeats itself. One of the things that's going on in the European Union, I spent a lot of years studying it, I'm, I'm a great admirer of it, but they basically, what they have done in Europe is take all these warring countries, all these countries that destroyed each other, all these ones that had not only the two uh, world wars, but the 30-year war and the other wars of conquest um, in Europe, and they have re, they've rewritten their own history. They have changed their own history. 
they have decided that neighbors make better customers than enemies, <clears throat> and they've acted on this. This doesn't mean an outbreak of brotherly love. The French still hate the Germans, and the Germans hate the French, and the British can't stand either of them, but they're not fighting about it anymore, and that, and that is uh, basic. One thing that we, we played a role, let me finish with this, because it's an idea. Let me bring this back to the Midwest. We played a role in this after World War II, and it was called the Marshall Plan, in which we sent billions of dollars to Europe to enable them to rebuild their war-shattered economy. But we said to the Europeans, we're not going to tell you what to do. You've got to figure out what's to do, what, what, what ideas you want. And if they sound good, then we'll pay for it. And we aren't going to give this money to Norway or the Netherlands or France or Germany or Italy, individual countries. You guys have all got to come together and rebuild your continental, your regional economy. You've got to do this <coughs> together. And they said, basically, we can't do that. We just got done killing each other. And we said, basically, do you want the money or don't you? And so they sat down and they did it. And within, this led immediately to the creation of some European um, institutions like the European Payments Bank, the start of the OECD started then, and within five years, the first of the European communities, the iron and steel community, was formed. Shortly after that, the European Economic Commission was formed, and I don't think it's too much to say that the Marshall Plan, by insisting on this regional European continental approach, sowed the seeds of what later became the European Union. Wouldn't it be great if the Obama administration, after it gets done with the stimulus and all that, is still going to have some money that it spends normally on infrastructure and industry and education and all that. Wouldn't it be great if the Obama administration came to the Midwest and said, we're not going to give any of this money to Iowa or to Minnesota or to Illinois or Indiana. You guys want the money. You've got to get together and figure out how you're going to do it together on a regional basis. You want bio? You all got plants and animals. Come on, get together. You want to do something on um, water resources? The Great Lakes lap at eight different states. It makes no sense just to give a water resource money to, to one state. Rivers that rise in Minnesota end up flooding in Iowa. You want to do stuff for wind energy? The wind blows across state lines as though they don't exist. You guys get together. And if you, want the, if you want this money, you have got to come together and plan for a regional revival. Um, we're as ornery as the Europeans. Well, we, at least we haven't fought a couple world wars about it. And I think that sort of approach, that kind of money, would be a terrific stimulus to finally getting us together to do something in a way in which this Midwest, our Midwest, can thrive in this whole new world, and it is a new world called globalization. Thank you so much, Dick, for coming again and uh, for your wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah.